from Studio 1A, this is the Vicendus Network. And now, please welcome your host, Emmy Award-winning reporter and MBA, Mr. Bruce Lindsay. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to Vicendas, the network of things worth seeing. Today, from 50 downlink sites nationwide, we look ahead to the leaders of the future and how to manage in our increasingly diverse and complex workplaces with the first seminar in the Vicendas Management Series. But before we begin, let's take a moment now and look back at a few highlights from our broadcasts. We began with three men who are true American heroes. The world watched and waited as the real crew of Apollo 13 faced the ultimate test of crisis management. They were here at the Vicendus Network and taught us their approach to leadership and that failure is not an option. Apollo 13, swim aircraft remains up. This is a recovery, uh, actually is a no further. Roger, swim one, well, have you baby city? As a boy who once dreamed of being an astronaut, I can't tell you what a thrill it is for me to welcome the real history-making men of the Apollo 13 team, including Gene Kranz, the man who kept things going in Houston as the mission director, Fred Hayes, the astronaut and uh, landing module pilot, astronaut Ken Mattingly, the man who had perhaps the most famous non-case of the measles in history. Gentlemen, <laughs> welcome to all of you. Perhaps the definition of a team that everybody's individual career is predicated on the success of the team. And, and when you are mutually dependent for success on what the aggregate does, you, you tend to shift your emphasis towards that objective instead of your own agenda. Well, I think one of the things that uh, uh, Ken and Fred have touched on is basically the culture of operations. And as we grew up in the Mercury and Gemini programs, we established this culture. It was a culture of success, but it was really a culture of excellence. We had four words we lived by, discipline, morale, tough, and competent. And these were the characteristics we thought we brought to the table, and we expected everybody else in mission control and the crews and the Capcoms to bring to the table. So with this set of beliefs, this now gives the, the tools to go do the kinds of things that we did uh, in every, every one of our space missions. That was clearly the culture that worked for this task. Is that applicable, you think, those four attributes across the board to all cultures, corporate cultures, business cultures, management cultures? I think that there, that's, it's the foundation for establishing the trust that develops into the shared values that then allows you to go out and do things, yes. Three men who still have the right stuff. Dr. Warren Bennis talked about creating and then communicating a vision to an organization, while Patricia Fripp led us in on her secret of negotiating from strength, and Don Hudson helped us understand the principle of selling different people differently. Leadership has got to make very clear, I want to repeat this, uh, with unbridled clarity, what is rewarded, what is punished, and what is ignored. After spending years working 12 and 14 hours a day, I came to the heartbreaking realization a lot of poor people work really hard. Then I went into business for myself. I started taking seminars, hanging around with these fancy management philosophy types. They said, Patricia, you don't have to work harder. You have to work smarter. And of course, today we have heard that ad nauseum. But what exactly does it mean? At that point, I would focus on goals, priorities, time management. But that was 1975. This is 1996. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Harder and Smarter. Do you realize this is the first time in history we can no longer predict the future by looking at the past. A lot of the present is already obsolete and the future that we are planning for, a lot of it is totally beyond our comprehension. What a great time to be in business. This is a time when we can use technology to serve our customers, but we shouldn't lose the personal touch. This model is the best one I've ever seen for identifying with the differences in people so that we can zero in on variable sales approaches. Expressives, we say, are into dreams and intuitions. 
Now, to give you an immediate frame of reference, this is the quadrant your speaker of the moment fits into. Let me tell you what's good about expressive behavior. At our best, we are perceived by many as stimulating, dramatic, and enthusiastic. At our best, that goal-focused behavior helps us get a lot done. And, and we get into it with a great excitement. In fact, we believe in personal jets for everybody. Dreams and intuitions, that's the payoff for us. At our best, that serves us well. Now, at our worst, we also have some weaknesses. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this. <laughs> at our worst, we are perceived by many as loud mouths. It's not that funny. How loud mouth are we? Give you an idea. Years ago, our oldest son approached his mother. He said, uh, Mom, I want to ask you a question about sex. She was not ready for that program, but she's a quick thinker and a good delegator. She said, I'm busy. Your father's in there. Go ask him. Kid said, I didn't want to know that much about it. <laughs> well, the management series is coming right up. But whether this is your first uh, experience with Vicendus or your uh, uh, third, we are sure it won't be the last, especially not with the lineup we have today. Diana Williams is in studio with a preview of what's coming up. Diana? Thanks, Bruce. If you'll come with me, I want to show you just how young and diverse some of our viewers are. The diversity of today's audience is a phenomenon which we'll be examined in great detail by our first guest today. However, before we meet Dr. Roosevelt Thomas and hear his thoughts on managing diversity, let's go backstage where we find our afternoon speaker, Dr. Marshall Goldsmith. Good morning, Dr. Goldsmith. Hello, Diana. You'll be speaking to us a little later on the leader of the future, but right now it looks like you're speaking to some of our leaders of the future. Yeah, that's right, and if these young people from uh, Salt Lake City's West High School are any indication, I think the future is in good hands. Oh, great to hear. Good morning to all of you. Hi. Welcome. I'm going to be talking this afternoon about the leadership excellence process, the unique characteristics that differentiate those outstanding leaders of the future from their peers, and I think it's going to tie in very well with what Dr. Thomas has to say in the area of diversity. Mm, absolutely. And we're going to continue here for a little while, and we'll see the rest of you in just a little bit. Thank you, Diana and Marshall Goldsmith. To get to our management series, we've brought a man who many consider to be America's foremost expert on diversity management. His groundbreaking approach to diversity, diversity focuses on both differences and similarities among people in the workplace. He's a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Morehouse College and earned his MBA in finance at the University of Chicago before going on to Harvard, where he obtained his doctorate. He is also the founder and president of the American Institute for Managing Diversity. Please welcome this morning Dr. Roosevelt Thomas. I'm delighted to be here this morning. I'm pleased to bring you greetings from Morehouse College, where we're located, and the American Institute for Managing Diversity. We started the Institute now about 11 years ago, concerned about issues related to upward mobility and retention with respect to minorities and women. Shortly after launching the Institute, we came across the beginnings of what is now known as the Workforce 2000 Report. That report, as you may know, sponsored by the Department of Labor and prepared by the Hudson Institute, projected some serious changes in the flow or composition of the workforce. Now, those projections plus our own way of thinking led us to believe that the issue is broader than black, white, male, female, minority, majority, but a broader issue of how do you manage someone who's not like you and who does not necessarily aspire to be like you. But that's a new phenomenon for the manager. The manager has typically been able to assume that he or she would be managing someone like him or herself. Now, once we reached this conclusion, we started to tease out a definition of managing diversity that is distinct from understanding differences, distinct from what is known as affirmative action. What I would like to do this morning is to share with you some highlights of that teasing out. Now, we like to do it in a way that uh, welcomes questions. So from time to time, I will stop and ask if there are any questions. And I would welcome questions from, from the audience here and also from those in the downlink sites as well. The real driving force behind the reality of diversity and the need to talk about managing diversity is a changing attitude toward being different. Now, you hear a lot of talk today about how great differences are, how they enrich us, how we embrace differences, how everything is so great about differences. What's the reality? 
the reality is that historically nobody has wanted to be different. Being different, you were weird, you were inadequate, you were less than. So when people came to your door and said, I want to be employed by you, what they were fundamentally saying is, can I come in? shed myself of this state of being different, become like you, and experience the success that you are experiencing. Now, what's going on today in corporations? What's going on, you have coming toward you people who are different, but they are comfortable in being different. They don't see it as better than, they don't see it as less than, they see being different as just a reality. They may even celebrate being different. And that is what gives us the reality of diversity. Why? If you go back and think about that jar we talked about a few minutes ago, you have this jar of red jelly beans, you have the yellow and the purple jelly beans. Traditionally, what has happened as the yellow and purple jelly beans have joined the red jar? Traditionally, the yellow and purple jelly beans have either been transformed into red jelly beans or transformed to the point where you can take a yellow jelly bean, a red, a purple jelly bean, and put a small aura beside it. And that small aura says these may be yellow jelly beans, they may be purple jelly beans, but they will behave as if they are red. So you look out and you see all kinds of diversity, but it's only diversity on the surface as a result of the transformation process. What happens when the yellow jelly bean, the purple jelly bean says, I'm comfortable in being different. I'm comfortable in being yellow. I'm comfortable in being purple. What happens? The yellow jelly bean, the purple jelly bean, look at the red jar. You are a great jar. You are a great organization. Want to join you. Understand that if I'm going to join you, I have to be assimilated. I have to be transformed. I'm prepared to do it. Let's get on with it. But let's do it around requirements. Let's not do it around traditions. Let's not do it around preferences. Let's not do it around conveniences. Let's do it around absolute requirements. Now, what does that mean? That means that you have selected assimilation. You end up with differences on the surface and differences below the surface. And that is driven by the fact that people are prepared to be comfortable in being different. 